the bug. Now, that may be good for the person, but it's really good for the bug because then that diarrhea can contaminate other water and they can jump onto other hosts, right? So same thing like you get a runny nose and a cough, you're sneezing and everything's going out. You're clearing it out, but it's really good for the virus because it gets, or TB, because it gets distributed. Same type of thing here. But the problem is some people, particularly infants and children, this would get out of control and they would lose so much water they would get dehydrated. And they're, they're in, in, in India, they are around Calcutta, there are these, these beds where people would sit down with their buttocks exposed so they could keep track of all the diarrhea they were producing so they could make sure they put the same amount of fluids back in. That's how severe cholera can be. So we did studies on this. All these uh, groups of mice had the cholera toxin, but this is a control and a dose-dependent, uh, progressively increased dose. You can see the accumulation of fluid in the intestine uh, reduced in a dose-dependent way. This would be the baseline level. So what it does, what it does is actually block this, this chloride ions from, from it, it takes it back to normal. It doesn't block it 100%, but takes it back to normal. So you still have bowel movements, but you're not having diarrhea. Versus taking Imodium or Lomatil, where, where it can paralyze your gut, and that can be dangerous. Here's another study. And so the toxin comes in, interacts with the lumen, and causes chloride ions and excess water. And the way this works is basically blocking this uh, chloride ion secretion. And so we published it in the American Journal of Physiology, 1999. We did another study uh, with some of my colleagues at Berkeley uh, on a, an extract. And uh, I'm just going to, what's interesting, this shows a standardized extract versus a single molecule. And they work essentially the same way. So just taking the latex from the tree is going to work as well as, as the pharmaceutical. So here's a study. OK, these were honeymooners coming in from the US and Europe, arriving in Jamaica and Mexico, OK? All excited. And so they got to the desk, and they were told, welcome. You're going to have a great time. But by the way, if you develop diarrhea, you have an option to enroll in our study. And you have a 50% chance of getting the real medicine or the placebo. And this is how we did the study. We had Jamaican and Mexican doctors and nurses conducting this study. And look at the p-values, really dramatic p-values at time to last time forms to 48 hours. So anything less than 0.05 is considered significant. So this was shown, and also a reduction of abdominal pain and urgency. DuPont is one of the authors. He's, he's down in Texas. He calls himself Dr. Diarrhea, and he's, he's, he's amazing. So this was done really well. Abdominal pain urgency reduced. Uh, and then we did here uh, at Stanford in-house phase two study HIV-associated diarrhea. And with this, we had all these patients in-house, 51, 25 placebo, 26 study, and you compare Everything that went in and went out was measured and and because uh, they were uh, in, in the hospital. And you can see the placebo versus the treatment. And this is a reflection of the stool weight. And the stool weight being much lower in the treatment is because there wasn't as much chloride ions and fluid coming out. And so we published this in the American Journal of Gastroenterology as well. And we did a phase three study. Uh, the, the good news on this is that these studies we did back in the late 90s, OK? And then we ran out of money, but it eventually was out licensed. And a new uh, company called Salix, which means willow, took it on and uh, took it the rest of the way. And it was FDA approved about three years ago. I didn't get a penny for it. That's OK. But, uh, but it's for people with AIDS. HIV-related diarrhea. So all along, we were doing work with local communities. 
to make sure there were systems for sus sustainably harvesting the bark latex of this. And we even have a manual for the sustainable harvest of, of the bark latex here. And we supported a number of studies to understand the biology and ecology of this. And these were the number of communities that signed on to be suppliers. Because these things are weedy trees. They grow along their fields, along their houses. They cut them down and burn them. And now they're able to cut them down and get, get some economic benefit from them. See, some of these are th thumbprints. Pretty cool. This is in uh, uh, indigenous groups in Peru. So this was a gentleman that uh, uh, I learned about this croton plant from. Uh, he is a very powerful healer, an ayahuascaro. Uh, he, he's a shaman, and, but tremendously knowledgeable and generous uh, 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 on his, and, and with that community, uh, we, we spent a lot of time. I was back and forth there quite a number of times. But he made it all possible. Okay, thank you. In the use of botanical medicines, there, it seems like there's a lot of promise both in the field of antibiotic resistance and using plants that um, don't have the same issues with antibiotic resistance, and that being a growing issue in healthcare. Um, and also the use of botanical medicines. You talked about um, traditional healers being the first line of medicine in the majority of the world's population. I also like to think about um, the economic and decentralized nature of botanical medicine, the, the economically accessible and decentralized nature of botanical medicine and its use in, in urban situations and rural poor situations in industrialized nations. And um, so I'm curious both in, in the use of antibiotic, use of botanical medicines for antibiotic resistance as well as for, for economic um, access, what do you feel like are some pathways or, or some barriers to, to overcome to help those uh, branches occur? Well, the, the demise of botanical medicines in this country about 100 years ago was the result of the AMA and pharmaceutical industry coming together and closing down a lot of herbal schools. But it wasn't based on science, because Germany continued the, that work. So did China, so did India, so did Vietnam, OK? So the, the, the fact that botanicals have been so marginalized, it wasn't based on science, it was other factors. But I really like your point about the antibiotic resistance, because artemisinin comes from artemisia annuum. And that has not just artemisinin, but a variety of molecules that are related that are anti-malarial. And they've been using it documented for thousands of years. And it's still been effective. So when you take a plant extract that has a number of related molecules, the bacteria is not near as clever at developing resistance to all of them. When you throw one drug at them, they can do it. Okay, And that's the beauty of these plant extracts, is that there's enough there that resistance is much less likely to occur. And also, what's important is you survive if you have an infectious disease. It's, it's OK if you get some of the disease, some of the infection, because then you get an immunological response and get protection, like with malaria. Okay, And, uh, and so these, these complex plant medicines with multiple molecules in them may not knock it out like a silver bullet, but you survive. And then you also get the benefit of antibody uh, response that you develop. And so it's interesting. People get strep throat. If you treat it immediately versus waiting a day, you're more likely to have a recurrence if you treat it immediately, let, let alone waiting a day. And so this, this, this whole thing. But you know those 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 are good questions. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
I've been in the pharmaceutical industry for many years. I won't say how long, but um, I was aware of shame in pharmaceuticals in the 90s. And um, so uh, relative to that, I know that part of the reason that they kind of didn't bring anything to market is the prohibitive cost of developing drugs and doing the, the kind of randomized clinical studies that are necessary, which is something on the order of $50 million in general to bring a drug to market. And I've done a lot of my own research um, in the literature on uh, herbal and botanical approaches to optimizing health and treating disease. I use a lot myself, actually, every day. Um, but I know one of the limitations is that there isn't like a regulatory pathway for um, these, uh, these herbals or some kind of regulatory mechanism by sa which saying that, okay, this is not a, an approved drug, but we recognize that there are uh, sufficient studies in the literature indicating benefic be, you know, um, physiological benefits or, or for this kind of indications or... Structure function claim. Yeah, so, so that, that in, other, in, so in order to make these, these, um, these herbals and botanicals more readily available to the public and giving some kind of regulatory sanction, it seems to me like developing a regulatory, through the FDA, developing a regulatory mechanism for um, at least, you know, o some oversight and, and reviewing the literature to provide some level of um, gradation about the level of evidence that's, that exists for their, their uh, benefit in treating these conditions. I'm wondering if you could speak to that and if you have any experience or, or ideas about yeah. how to bring that about. Well, with, with herbals, I think that, uh, uh, Number one, there, there are a number of botanical medicine people who would have offered to s provide that service to the FDA, and they didn't really take the bait on that, okay? Well, it's not even bait, it's just an offer, right? And uh, uh, so I personally think that herbal medicine should be more carefully regulated by knowledgeable people. Okay, there is a problem because you got a cash register ringing, okay? And, uh, and it doesn't matter how groovy a product is, once the cash register is ringing, you can get distortions that come in. And there have been documented cases of looking at extracts of ginseng and analyzing those and finding uh, a low percentage were actually even had ginseng in it. And so uh, I think that things need to be better regulated and also having botanical collections, voucher collections for each collection they have of these. But what's even cooler though is when you go into a Chinese medicine dispensary in Oakland or San Francisco, the raw herbs are there. I mean, when we go buy food at the market, we go to Andronico's or wherever we go, eh, it's broccoli. There's no ifs or buts. It's broccoli. It's either organic or conventional. We're looking at it, okay? Uh, carrots, we're looking at. We're not getting a, a capsule with ground up carrot. At least I hope you're not. You know, hope, hope, but some people are kind of moving that direction. Uh, but, and so likewise, with, with the herbal medicines, the more raw, like Lhasa Karnak, you can go in there, you can see the herb, you can smell it. I think if you're going to buy herbs, it's best to get them where you can actually see them and, and you get used to understanding what they smell like and what, what they taste like. Some companies that produce herbals that do standardize potency and, and provide you know, oversight of verification that, that the product contains. But above and beyond that, I'm, I'm speaking of a regulatory mechanism to provide uh, some oversight of the literature that exists on these various right. botanicals to say that, yes, there is you know, sufficient literature to suggest this may be potentially beneficial for treating yeah. cancer for this or so that. So and, and because there, are, there is literature. People yeah. say there's not science. There is science on a lot oh, of things. Oh, there's plenty of science. Not, it's just not profitable science. So well, we'll as profitable. Well, actually, so the, the, you know the Deshea Law, the Dietary uh, uh, Supplement Health and, uh, Health and Education Act, right? That came out about 20 years ago. It's called the Deshea, and that basically opened the way for herbs that had a history of being used were allowed to be sold. 
And you know who the co-writers were on that? Orrin Hatch, Utah, right-wing Republican. But Utah has the highest concentration of herb companies in this hemisphere. And Tom Harkin, a liberal Democrat from Iowa. They put that together, and it had more uh, public letters going into Congress than any issue uh, since the Vietnam War. And it, it transformed our attitude toward herbal medicines. And, and, and it led to the NIH having the Office of Complementary and Alternative Medicine and, and all these things. But I think there's still a lack of a link with, with more botanists being involved with it. So you, you, you have it down. Um, so I'm a, I'm a gardener and chef, and my interest lies mostly in the effects of foods and drugs on personality and mood, and um, and the psychological parts of of food. So, and there seems to be an intimate connection in these indigenous groups with the shamans, the healers, working with people with their mental and physical health at the same time. And I, I would like to hear your thoughts about if if that if they should be coupled or they should be broken apart like we've done in our Western society. And then uh, kind of a follow-up question. Um, is there anything, there's kind of a movement right now returning to wild foods um, because we think that in our, in our um, conventional food system we've bred out a lot of things that we may be missing in foods that we are not sure. They do things for us, but we're not sure what they are and haven't identified them, the phytochemical, phyto kind of things, and I'd like to hear your comments on both of them. Okay, so uh, with, with the wild foods, uh, I actually forage and, uh, you know, I, I uh, do this foraging with uh, a statistics professor over at Berkeley, and uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, because you've got bitters and you go out and you forage these. And what's interesting, these are wild edible weeds that governments pay money to spray, OK? And they're beautiful. I mean, look at a dandelion. It's gorgeous. Yeah, you eat it. It's a, it's a little bitter. But it's gorgeous. Why would you want to spray it? And this whole mentality of have a monoculture of grass, you know? And, get out anything that's in there. And so there's, there's, there's kind of that, that mentality. But when you, when you eat those, you, you, number one, you don't have to water them. You don't have to fertilize them. You don't have to plant them. You don't have to weed them. And they're growing in food deserts all over, all year round here. Even in the driest part, you, you can find them. And the bitters, uh, I, I spoke on this earlier today, the bitters, there are bitters like coffee. Here I go, man. I'm rocking. This is my fifth cup today, OK? <laughs> but there's bitters in here. And the bitters stimulate the, gall, the gallbladder to produce bile and stimulates digestive enzymes. And, and so same, same thing with, with the different wild edibles. Well, there's bitter taste buds, and so uh, if you read in most books, they say, well, we have the bitter taste buds, so when we taste the bitter, we get rid of it. And I beg to differ. I, I, because when I work with traditional healers, they're, they're walking around, and their dorsum of their tongue is a chemoreceptor. And there are true chemoreceptors on the tongue. And they're tasting. I've, I've been going through forests with healers, forests they'd never been in before. And they're going through and they're tasting. And from the dorsum of the tongue, they can have ideas of how it might be useful as a medicine. And that includes the bitters. Now, the highest concentration of the uh, genes that allow us to detect bitters are in sub-Saharan Africa, which I might add is also the, where malaria started. And many of the bitter herbs, OK, quinine is bitter. Artemisinin is bitter. Those are both anti-malarial pharmaceuticals. But bitters are really, really important uh, to stimulate digestion, to uh, uh, good for the liver. And, and you know, when I say bitter, 
there, there's data on coffee that people who are heavy drinkers is actually protective against developing liver cirrhosis. I'm not saying it'll prevent it, but it actually has a, had a protective effect. And I think other bitters do, do something similar like that. And so uh, I believe walking around in forest, you use the bitter taste buds to detect bitters that can have health benefits. You might also detect something that, no, I'm, I'm going to stay away from that. But uh, uh, then getting back to the, you know, the mood uh, enhancing foods and so forth. So, you know, if you're talking about ayahuasca, strong psychedelics, hallucinogens used for Im important shamanic, that's, that's one end of the spectrum. But then you're talking about comfort foods, foods that give people part of a cultural identity, even theobroma cacao, chocolate. Theobroma, food of the gods. It's, it, it has subtle, subtle uh, effects on mood and so forth. I mean, wh why is it the symbol for Valentine's Day? It's, it's no accident. Montezuma would drink liters of it, mix it with, with the, and so, uh, I think there can be the psychological benefits of the identity that people have with foods and the way they're prepared and, and all the cultural things. But then there are phytochemicals in there that also can have subtle TNS effects and the herbs and spices in particular. I mean, you know, I've walked out of, you know, Indian restaurants feeling a buzz from, from the spices, right? And but but not something where I'm inebriated, but it's like, there there's something going on there that's really subtle.